Hello everyone, thank you for joining us today. First, let me introduce myself. My name is Elika, I'm working as project manager at RECAP. It is my pleasure to welcome you today as the host in this webinar session, talking about the power of AI chatbot. Before we begin the session, we will start the recital of Surah Al-Fatihah to bless the session led by Haji Muhammad Nur Hafiz bin Haji Abdul Rahman. Alhamdulillah <laughs> Thank you for the prayer. Welcome everyone to the GB talk initiated by Authority for Info Communication Technology Industry of Brunei Darussalam or AITI. I'm very excited because after this, we're going to introduce our inspiring speakers and moderator. In this moment, I would like to invite Muhammad Zul Hilmi Bin Zaini. He is the manager of Digital Business Adoption Unit from AITI to deliver the opening remarks. <coughs> Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good afternoon to all of you. First of all, thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to participate in today's webinar. It is a pleasure to be here and welcoming you to the DigiBase talk on the power of AI chatbot. Ladies and gentlemen, DigiBase talk is one of the initiatives by the Authority for Info Communication Technology Industry of Brunei Darussalam, AITI, to encourage ICT and digital adoption in the country, particularly in supporting the growth of businesses through the series of seminar related to emerging technologies. Today's seminar aims to promote the opportunities of artificial intelligence in this era of digital transformation. As an overview of the current AI development, the two major global hubs of AI development are the United States and China. Meanwhile, ASEAN still lags behind. But there are some AI activities in each member state. Singapore has made the greatest advances, but there's also promising early sign in places like Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. The technology sector is naturally at the cutting edge of adoption. Although AI tools are being de deployed in sectors such as transportation, financial services, healthcare, and media. If harnessed in the right way, AI technologies have the potential to contribute to positive social outcomes in ASEAN. Machine learning innovations can be enhanced credit models and financial inclusions. For example, AI solutions model and financial inclusions. For example, AI solutions enable new types of preventive and remote healthcare. They may also improve diagnosis and speed of development of new drugs. Adaptive learning algorithms could play a role in delivering individualized and virtual education but most of the region will need to build foundational digital infrastructure and data ecosystem to realize this type of opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, in response to the current COVID-19 situation, Buena Darussalam has developed a digital healthcare application with AI capabilities called Brill Health. To date, about 87% 87 of Brunei population and about more than 4,000 businesses have registered to the application. The application provides an overview of active COVID-19 cases in the country. The application provides tools such as self-help assessment tools, quarantine monitoring, including epidemic map, as well as individual media records, medical records. To have a better understanding on the development of AI chatbots, in this session, we have, moder we have a moderator and two regional speakers who are an experts in the field of AI, particularly, particularly in the healthcare industry. Before I end, I would like to thank Recap Sundaran Berhad for facilitating this webinar. I wish everyone had an enjoyable and a very informative session. Wabillahi taufiq wa tayah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and thank you. Now I pass the floor back to Elika. 
Thank you, Zul, for the opening remark. And before we start, I'm going to explain the agenda for today's session. So after participant check-in, we have an opening as what we already have now. After that, we're going to have an introduction of our speakers and moderator, followed by presentations from both of our speakers. Dr. Karen Priyadarshini, she is the regional business lead, worldwide health at Microsoft Asia, and Rossi Satyo Nugroho, he is the product management lead at Prisa. And then we are going to have Q&A session, which will be facilitated by our moderator, Ihtimam Hossein. If you have any question regarding our topic during the presentation, you don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. You can just write it on Q&A chat box in Zoom, and then we will go through with it later on Q&A session. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator for today's session. He is a clinical product manager at BotMD, a health tech startup offering AI-powered chat and monitoring platform for healthcare and professional and patients. A pharmacist by training, he has a keen interest in how digital health technology can improve patient engagement and care. Before joining BotMD, he worked at Singapore General Hospital as an inpatient and drug information pharmacist. He is Ihtimam Hossein. Thank you for sparing your time to be able to facilitate our discussion today. Thank you, Alika. Uh, first off, I just want to uh, thank... Uh, Mr. Zul and his team from AITI, and also Elika and her team from Recap for um, giving me the opportunity to moderate this and also facilitating the whole discussion. Um, so um, let me share my screen. Okay. So I trust you should be able to see my screen now. So essentially what I'm going to do is that um, I'm just gonna to help to facilitate this discussion, but of course uh, our key speakers for today on the topic of uh, you know relating to the power of AI chatbots, particularly in the healthcare space and how uh, it can help improve patient experience. We have uh, two you know, very knowledgeable speakers, uh, Dr. Karen Priyadarshini from Microsoft, and also Mr. Rossi Setio Nugroho from Prixa. So we will hear a bit more from them uh, very soon. Um, before that, just to uh, add a bit of context. Um, so in case uh, some are not as familiar about the topic, I won't take too long with this. So we all understand that chatbots are becoming very, very uh, ubiquitous in our day-to-day. -day. We see them everywhere when you're trying to do online banking, when you're trying to do online shopping, they're chatbots. Um, of course, this also means that they offer significant opportunity in healthcare, uh, be, they, be it for patients or for healthcare professionals. Um, so for example, for patients particularly, they get access to health information. We have the ability to perform uh, triage functions, you know, symptom checkers and so on. There, there are chatbots also that are able to administer interventions, for example, around mental health uh, care and such. And also, of course, when we talk about um, the whole healthcare system as a whole, they can help to smoothen the patient's healthcare journey in terms of, let's say, booking appointments, looking for doctors, um, you know, finding the nearest pharmacy, et cetera. So of course, new cases are being iterated on constantly uh, because this is a new and evolving field. So we are very, I personally am very excited to hear from both speakers about what they have been working on um, in their settings. Um, but, Sorry. But at the same time, we also need to acknowledge that there are also challenges and outstanding questions that need to be tempered. So one thing we need to consider is, of course, whether our patients and our healthcare professionals are ready to embrace this technology, right? Um, even when I practice in Singapore, I can tell you that many patients, uh, especially the elderly, may not be familiar with such technologies. Secondly, is the technology itself ready? Is it safe? Is it accurate? Um, thirdly, how would we measure some of these outcomes in terms of success? Uh, would they be clinical outcomes? Would they be financial outcomes, safety outcomes? Um, and then tying into that, of course, uh, as we're all keenly aware, uh, there are definitely going to be discussions to be had around privacy and security, and then not to mention the legal risks and liabilities as well. And we also need to uh, acknowledge, of course, that Healthcare in and of itself is a traditionally conservative uh, industry. Uh, it's highly regulated. So sometimes even the adoption of technology can be um, sometimes a bit slower. 
but often it's slower, perhaps for a good reason as well, because we are talking about patients' uh, lives or patients' quality of life and treatment and so on. So uh, this gives me great pleasure to actually introduce our first speaker uh, for today, um, Dr. Karen Priyadarshini. She's a regional business uh, lead at um, a company we are all, everyone has heard of, uh, Microsoft. So she leads the company's healthcare business across 17 markets in Asia Pacific. Um, she's very passionate about empowering uh, you know, healthcare providers and other companies with the right technology in order to enable better patient outcomes and hopefully reduce the cost of that as well. Um, and her desire is also to create a world of intelligent healthcare through AI and the cloud to unlock biological insight and break data from silos, uh, which is often the case here with our traditional systems, uh, such that we have a truly personal understanding of human healthcare. And hopefully by so doing, we would enable better access to care, lower costs and improve outcomes. With this, I'm going to uh, invite Dr. Karen to um, go into her talk, um, after which then I will introduce the second speaker. Uh, Dr. Karen, please. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, um, so thank you so much for that very, um, I would say elaborate introduction. Um, I think um, I never knew I had so many things written on my particular bio, so thank you so much. And would love to kind of also thank you for um, this opportunity to be speaking with you. Um, so what I would definitely like to say before I begin is that, um, and I hope you're able to see my slides as well. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we can see yeah. it. Okay, perfect, yeah. Okay, so what is uh, what you correctly mentioned is that healthcare has always been a legard uh, and, but interestingly, during COVID and post-COVID, it has emerged as one of the most important industries. And there's a little joke um, that we all share amongst us is that what we couldn't achieve in the last two years, uh, we could achieve it in two months in healthcare. So there has been a big technological push uh, to healthcare um, because of this whole um, COVID uh, uh, time. And so hopefully we should be able to see some very interesting technological advances. And one of the very simple low hanging fruit is what we have as the healthcare bots. Uh, and as was correctly said, there's so many interesting use cases. And one of the things that you correctly mentioned was that, um, especially for people who are elderly, it's very difficult for them to type. It's very difficult for them to use technology. So what has become very interesting is voice enabled bots. Um, so all you need to do is to speak into your phone and the bot will be able to speak back to you uh, and reply to some of the questions that you might have. So what I'm gonna do in the next, I think I have about 20, 25 minutes to just share with you some of the very interesting use cases where the healthcare bot has been used. Um, needless to say that this is not exhaustive. This is probably just tip of the iceberg because even as we speak, people have begun to see the power of the um, bot. And what I do understand, I've not seen it myself, but what I do understand that even in like phone calls, for example, the bots are being trained using AI to mimic human voice. So much so that you don't even realize that it's actually a bot that you're speaking with. So the advancements are qu advancing quite fast. There are many, many interesting use cases and hopefully we should be able to see some very interesting applications in healthcare as well. So within Microsoft, we have our own healthcare bot. And as you can see over here, these are the three key pillars uh, where we um, have in terms of the use cases of the healthcare bot. The first, and what I would say is the low hanging fruit is del delivering intelligent conversational healthcare experiences. And this is where typically what happens is that you ask questions uh, or you're seeking information, for example, uh, it could be medical content. It could be even that, hey, um, where do I go um, for the A&E in a hospital, for example? Or it could even be symptom checking, especially during COVID times or triaging as well. Um, your daughter has a fever and you want to kind of, you know, use the bot to see what is it that you need to do? Is it very serious that you need to bring her to the hospital? Uh, because right now, during the current time, as you would all probably realize that even going to the hospital is not an easy task. Um, you've got so many protocols that you need to follow given COVID. So the bot kind of becomes very handy in such situations. Um, the second very important thing is empowering health organizations to build and extend intelligent health assistance. So it's not just for the patients, it's not just for the consumers, 
but within the hospital, um, the doctors, the nurses, the clinicians can also use. Um, they might want to kind of pull up, let's say, um, the lab report, or they might want to pull up, let's say, the Pax image. Um, and this is where you can actually type or you can speak into the bot. Um, the bot comes with AI, and so it's able to kind of pull and execute commands very seamlessly. So in short, what it does is to make that whole workflow much easier. Uh, instead of you having to click, click, click and find that information, the bot can actually do that for you uh, in a very quick and easy fashion. Um, and also, I mean, there are multiple things you can see that you have built-in reporting, you have operational um, excellence that you can bring about. You can shorten workflows, for example, or you might even have, let's say, silo data systems and you want to say, hey, I want A, B, C, and the bot is able to kind of bring that together. Another very interesting use case also is like in a hospital, let's say, if you're looking for Dr. X and unfortunately Dr. X is on leave. So the bot will look for who's the next in line, who's the next in command and ping them accordingly. So these are some very interesting workflows and use cases that we see when it comes to empowering health organizations. But all this is super important that we run this with confidence by leveraging a very secure and compliant platform. Because what we're looking at is patient data, and it's the most richest and wholesome data that you find on Earth. So definitely it's important that you have a bot that's, for example, HIPAA compliant or GDPR compliant, or it has ISO certification, so that it is more in alignment with the compliance and regulations that you have in each country. So having said that, as I just mentioned, one of the things that we emphasize a lot is that when you have a bot, um, it should be uh, according to the country norm. So every country has his, its own regulations as to what can be shared, what can be accessed, and who can access that. And above all, what we uh, we do um, we do um, note that it's extremely important to keep personal data and patient data anonymous. Um, so you see that these are the three or four certifications and compliance requirements that we think are mandatory. The GDPR, as I said, and ISO certifications, HIPAA, uh, being com HIPAA compliant, as well as um, being CSA star gold certified. So these are some of the very basic requirements that one does find um, to have. Now, going a bit deeper into what are some of the very interesting use cases that we have. The first, and I would say the low hanging fruit is conversational AI, which is what uh, the moderator just mentioned that you know you go to a bank or you go to a retail store, um, these are the kind of conversational AIs that you can have. But the interesting part is that when the bots get infused with AI, they're able to see or sense what are some of the interesting things that you're looking for. So you can see over here, uh, a patient is trying to say, you know, what would be my co-payment if I were to get a glucose test done? Or um, can I kind of co-pay with my insurance? So these are some of the very simple information conversational kind of AI um, which we find um, with in healthcare as well, basically answering some of the questions that one might have. And within Microsoft, what we also have is we have some very simple pre-built uh, healthcare bot templates. So you can see this is for COVID assessment. So this is for triaging and seeing if the caller or the patient has COVID. You also can, you have some frequent questions that, hey, you know, where can I get a test done? Um, how many days do I need to quarantine? What do I need to do? And so on and so forth, those kind of uh, FAQs. And then of course, metrics. So what are the things that you, know, you need to put in place to keep you safe and also keep others safe? And finally, triaging as well. So if somebody does have flu symptoms, um, then what are some of the simple questions that a bot can ask? Uh, and then say, hey, I think you really need to go and get a test done, or you need to go into the hospital, or you need to just stay home and rest. So these are some of the templates, pre-built templates that are available. And so you can quickly kind of, you know, use one of these. And at the bottom, as the moderator said, you can actually have a mental health um, screener. So for example, um, this is to check your mental health during the time of COVID or you know, booking an appointment because you really want to see a doctor or because you seem to have symptoms or you want to kind of hand it off to a human. So once the bot um, triages and feels that this is something that's beyond the capacity of a bot, it would then hand it over to a nurse or a clinician or a healthcare worker to kind of take it forward from there. And then of course, simple things like, you know, look up a hospital or even file a claim. These are some of the things that the bot can very easily execute. This is one of the very interesting um, cases that we did with Providence Hospital. 
Uh, and you can see over here, these are FAQs. Um, not now, but especially when the pandemic struck and every country was in throes, you would actually see that there was some very basic question that people would ask again and again. I mean, can I do this? Can I do that? Um, you know, what if I have symptoms? Is it really COVID? How do I kind of test this? So these kind of questions are very easily answered by a bot because they are repetitive, they are quite predictive. So, and the best thing is using AI, the bot can actually learn what are some of the questions that keep coming. And so um, is that something that I need to add into my FAQ and so on? So there are a lot of insights that you can also gather from the data that the bot uh, is sharing. And then of course, this is a very interesting example that we have with Denmark, uh, where we launched in Denmark uh, with the COVID-19 healthcare bot. Uh, and this was a couple of things because there was a whole lockdown so the bot was actually used to do a couple of things. One was to triage and see, you really need to leave your house and kind of go to the nearest um, medical center. And if I need to go to the medical center, which is my nearest one, how do I book an appointment? Um, how do I get my lab test done? Would the medication be delivered to me? And of course, a lot of other questions. How long is this going to last? Um, when is it that I can leave home? Uh, how long? And, you know, those kind of repetitive questions are very easily taken care of. And this is what we landed in Denmark. But the interesting thing was this, based on the questions that people were asking and based on like when you have an online teleconsult um, where, you know, a bot kind of hands it over to a real assistant. So from a virtual assistant, you actually go into a, a, a conversation with a real human. All in the process, data is being collected. And uh, what is interesting is that you can begin to profile. Um, so you begin to profile patients into different categories based on the data that the bot is collecting. It's got nothing to do with the medical information of the individual. It's got to do more with age, gender, um, what kind of symptoms are you having? What are the things that you did before? Where did you go? Where did you travel? So it becomes very interesting to share and see what kind of insights you can get from a simple usage of a bot as well. And then this I find very, very interesting. This is what we deployed at NHS where you have very fast virus notifications. Um, so for example, let's say you actually go to a lab uh, and you get a lab test done. I mean, I'm not sure where all you're dialing in from, but if you were to look at Singapore, probably you would get your lab test the next day. But if you were to go to other markets, like uh, in any of the Asia, Southeast Asian markets, it would take you at least a day or two um, to get the test done. And I understand that the COVID virus test takes longer. Uh, and this is where what you can do is using a bot, um, you can actually have the lab data connected with the hospital data. So even if the report is not fully available, as in when the test is completed from the lab, you can actually upload it into what we call as the Microsoft Teams. And using the bot, you can actually see over here that the doctor receives a laboratory alert saying, hey, you know, there is somebody who's tested positive um, for the COVID. So some of the other very interesting results that you can see is in radiology and pathology. And I wanted to share a few more examples. Uh, lab is one, pathology labs are another as well, where you know you want to get your results quicker and faster. And the doctor wants to be notified that, hey, this patient has tested positive. So you need to kind of um, set forth a separate protocol. And this is where you can see over here, you know, you can check you might want to look at your pathology reports, your radiology reports, or any other kind of tests and procedure. And once you select that, um, you can actually see um, the bot actually saying, hey, the report is ready. First and foremost, you need to know if the report is ready. So yes, the report is ready. And if you were to click on it, um, you will see that you can actually see the report. Uh, and then you need to acknowledge that you have seen it. Um, so this is where I I think it makes it much faster instead of having to wait uh, for, uh, you know, the lab report to be uploaded into the system. You can actually get results um, on your mobile itself. So this was one to have an alert come in. Um, so for example, you can also have a lab alert coming in saying that, you know, a sample has been sent for COVID testing. So somebody who's at the lab can also get the alert saying, hey, this is something that is urgent and most important. So these are some of the very interesting workflows that the health bot can actually kind of shorten. The other very interesting example is clinical trial recruitment. Um, I'm not sure if how many of you are aware, but you know, typically when you have these drugs, uh, especially now, like for example, for the COVID vaccine, um, you really need to recruit 
uh, the right type of patients for a clinical trial that you're conducting. The very old fashioned way of doing it is, um, you know, you go look through patients hospital by hospital and the pharma company kind of you know, spends a lot of time and money recruiting these patients for a particular drug trial. Now, the, the sad part of that being that during this whole course of the clinical recruitment and the clinical trial, which happens for about, I think, two to three years, um, patients drop out. Patients drop out due to many reasons. A, they're not the right patient. Um, they don't kind of match the right profile or they don't, they're not willing to go any further because it's very inconvenient. And what you can do is using a simple bot, and this is something that we deployed at NHS, what you can do is you can lay down all the parameters. You can say, hey, the patient should be having this profile. It should be suffering from these kind of diseases for this many days and should be living within one kilometer of the hospital so the patient does not have to travel. And what the bot will do is, given this particular profile, it will dip into the medical records and be able to earmark some of the patients who are eligible uh, for that particular clinical trial. So as and when this patient comes in, you will get an alert saying, hey, the patient X actually matches the profile of the patient that is required for trial X. And so it becomes much more easier, faster. Above all, it's much more accurate to be able to match the patients with the kind of drug trial that is ongoing. And I think at the moment now, when we're looking at COVID vaccine, uh, where, we are, where we are trying to shorten these clinical trial processes, I think this becomes very, very interesting as well. The other one that's very uh, nice is uh, the image upload bot. Um, so normally, as you know, um, many of you who've been in hospitals, you will see that when you know doctors, they see their patients have something some kind of a rash or they see some kind of a abnormality on the body or on the skin, they'll take pictures and then they'll WhatsApp it. Uh, now, the problem with those kind of things is that it's not secure uh, because uh, I'm not sure if you read, but many times you see that these images leak out and then, you know, especially if they're celebrities and so on, then you see them in the internet on a free float. Now, what you can do with the bot is, and within Teams, it's a very secure uh, way of taking a photograph using your mobile phone, and you cannot download that into your phone. So it stays within the app, and what you can do is you can use the bot to upload um, these images onto the electronic medical record. So it becomes much more easier, faster, and you can decide. You want it to be uploaded into the medical record, or you want to send it to the PACS, uh, or you want to send it to the EDMS. Uh, it's totally possible. And best of all is it's compliant and safe because nobody can kind of, you know, share that images across um, different uh, um, um, social media, for example. And the other thing is that you can tag these images to your specific patient or specific medical record. As well. That makes it really, really very easy. And the, the I think the best use of this particular capability is with um, the nurses. Because nurses, you know, when they do their rounds, um, they can actually see that um, there are certain, let's say the patient has had a fall or the patient has had some bleeding. Those are some of the pictures that you can really take and upload as well. I'd like to share with you a very interesting case on diabetes, because as you see in this part of the world, um, in, especially in Southeast Asia, diabetes has become one of the silent killers as it's known as. So if you look at the left side, um, one of the biggest problems that we face with diabetes is it's a long disease. Uh, it stays with you till the end and therefore adherence, drug adherence, that you need to take your medication regularly, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. So that adherence becomes very important and most of the patients have very poor adherence. So if you look on the left side, the study results have shown that um, when you don't have adherence, when the patients don't adhere, then you have the drug, drug costs uh, are much higher. So the, when more people adhere, obviously the cost that, or the money that the hospital is gonna get is gonna be much higher. But at the same time, when um, there is poor adherence, what you see there, the hospitals see a loss of revenue because they get lesser money per patient. Uh, and therefore the loss as you can see is almost 10 to 14 billion. But having said that, that's the revenue side. But having said that, if you look at the benefits of improved adherence, you will see over here that your engage, your adherence, the patient's adherence to a drug um, becomes better when you're able to kind of A, use AI powered education, which means it's tailored to the type of patient that you have. Second, it focuses on the root cause. Why is this, why is it that this patient is not adhering to his or her medication? 
The third could be notification. So you need to periodically monitor that patient, whether he or she is taking the medication. And lastly, a gaming experience. If you make it more fun, uh, it's more, how to say, engaging, then the patients are seen to be more adhering to medication. And you will see that when there is increased adherence, um, you will see that the cost per patient goes down. Uh, simply because when you have more patients adhering, uh, hospitalization is lesser, amputation is lesser. So the overall costs actually go down while the patient outcomes become much better because now the disease is much better controlled uh, as well. So you must be wondering what has all this got to do with a bot, right? Um, so I want to share with you one of our partner solutions called CareSpay. And you can see over here, um, you have different kind of, you know, mm, uh, behavioral translators. You have somebody who's tired, depressed, weak, stressed, agitated. And then what the bot does is that this is especially very true for patients who've just been diagnosed as diabetic. So it's just been three to six months since they've started filling their medication. Uh, this is where the bot comes in and says, hey, how can I help you? Um, so you can choose coach me, provide me with tips or challenge me, depending on the kind of personality that you have. And this is where then the bot gets into action and you will see over here that patients are then segregated into two or three different types. So here you see the novice. Uh, this particular novice is novice is somebody who's new, who's who's like you know not very knowledgeable, and he or she is struggling to manage the diabetes. And so once the bot identifies it to be of this profile, you will see that you know the bot can actually send in education topics. How do you cope? How do you get support? How do you prepare for your appointment? How do you administer insulin? So don't be worried. This is the way that you can do step by step. And then what are some of the desired actions that you have through the bot? You want to educate the patient better. You want to have a more uh, regular routine, ad better adherence. So you can actually set these uh, parameters and say, I, I would like, like what the moderator was saying, what are some of the outcomes that you desire? How do you measure them? So these are some of the things that you can actually aim to achieve. Uh, and then of course, you can, based on the level of commitment that the patient has, uh, you might want to nudge them with something that is very personalized. Like a, a person like me is very lazy on a weekend. So uh, probably come Monday, you might want to write on my guilt and say, hey, Karen, you've been uh, inactive for the last two days. How about moving those legs, you know? So it's a very personalized kind of a messaging that works and also making it fun. So the bot can actually throw a challenge and say, hey, you know, you did 2000 steps yesterday. How about going in for another 500? So making it more fun, having rewards, having that gamification kind of a thing really improves adherence. And all this can be achieved through a simple bot that one can have. And what I was saying in the beginning as well, you see in this whole process, the bot is collecting data. Uh, it's not like medical records, but this is nevertheless data. Uh, and so you can actually draw insights from here. You can say, hey, what are the different clusters of patients that I have? Um, how many of them are controlled? How many of them are uncontrolled? What are the reasons for being uncontrolled? And then with these insights, the doctor can actually tailor um, the whole um, prescription process, the whole diet, the treatment process in a much better way. So all the while you're kind of, you know, upping the game and you're saying, how do I get better and better insights as I get more data to be able to manage that disease uh, in such a way that, you know, you don't lose quality of life. I mean, nobody, now people are living longer, but nobody wants to live and, you know, be so sick and be so disabled that you don't enjoy life anymore. So these are some of the simple things where you can use data to really understand and tailor treatments for the patients using the bot. The last one I wanted to share is very interesting. You know, when you, I don't know how many of you have got admitted, but when you're lying on the bed and you know, you've got, you're admitted for two, three days, um, you can move, you can think, you can talk, but there isn't much, nothing, nothing much to do except probably read books. What if you had at your bedside, as you can see on the right side, like a neat little menu and you can actually talk to the menu and say, hey, what's the latest movie um, that's being shown? Or especially for children, uh, in this particular case, it's for children healthcare in Atlanta. You know, children are very restless. It's very difficult to keep them in bed. Um, so you want to kind of use the bot and the, the kids could say, hey, uh, what's the newest game that you have? Or what's the menu that I'm going to have? Uh, what's the menu for dinner that I'm going to have in the evening and so on? So this is something that we integrated with the uh, medical uh, electronic medical record for Epic. So Epic was the um, EMR provider. And it was like a very interesting web chat uh, bedside application 
Uh, and then you, of course, have to get content from somebody else, but you can really make it fun at the same time engaging uh, using a simple bot to kind of pull out um, the particular uh, information or a category that you want. So these are some of the very interesting ways in which the healthcare bot comes alive. I just want to end with that and um, uh, great to hear some questions from you as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Karen, um, for that very insightful talk. I personally have a lot of questions. Um, I'm sure our audience do as well. Um, keep submitting your questions. Uh, perhaps what I'll do first is uh, we will, uh, uh, let me introduce uh, Rossi and then let's hear from him and then we could have a more vibrant uh, discussion amongst ourselves. Okay, let me just uh, pull up my slides. Okay, so our next speaker uh, is uh, Mr. Rossi, who's a product management lead at Prixa. So his skills are really in translating uh, the company's strategy and the, and the requirements uh, that Prixa relies on in order to build a variety of features uh, for easy and accessible healthcare in Indonesia. So it'd be good to hear that perspective uh, in the Indonesian context from him. Um, of course, before he was with uh, Prixa, he has successfully managed a lot of operations and BD um, in the healthcare industry. Um, he also has a background in uh, Master of Public uh, Administration, Health and Policy and Management from the New York University. And as I just found out uh, recently, he's also a pharmacist like me. So uh, with that, I'm gonna hand over the time uh, to Rossi to bring us through his uh, sharing. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone. Thank you so much uh, for giving the opportunity for us to present what we have been doing in Indonesia, uh, especially with the AI technology and healthcare specifically. Um, so, uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, piggybacking on what everyone has been saying about how this past few months has been really important for healthcare uh, development all over the world, like uh, all of those things that we have never get to do in healthcare is suddenly happening because of COVID. And this has opened so much uh, opportunity for healthcare to grow and for the industry to learn how to leverage technology in delivering the services so much better to the patients. And accessibility, of course, is always uh, at the top of our uh, mind because uh, it seems to never enough uh, for us to provide um, access to patients, especially in Indonesia. If you look at Indonesia, uh, I think uh, a lot of us think that it's pretty small, but at the same time, it's very fragmented and big. It's like uh, for the most populous country in the world, and we have 17,000 islands. So the problem of accessibility is really, really, um, uh, you know, uh, important in Indonesia that uh, People live in different cities and different areas. Indonesia has different access to healthcare, and it has been a problem that we've constantly trying to solve. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, improvement in terms of the metrics uh, when it comes to healthcare. We have um, over the past uh, decades, uh, we've seen that life expectancy is uh, increasing, and also uh, the infant mortality rate is decreasing with the access of healthcare. Uh, but with all of these things happening in Indonesia, uh, we are seeing that the healthcare expenditure in Indonesia is uh, relatively really low compared to other countries in Southeast Asia and in Asia in general. Uh, we have 3.12% um, spending for healthcare. And um, the out-of-pocket spending for everyone uh, in Indonesia is around 40%, which is really high. That's why in 2014, the government is uh, launching national healthcare coverage that's called BPJS right now. It's really big. So it's it basically tries to cover everyone in Indonesia to have uh, healthcare insurance. 
And right now it's around 20 to 30% of people who still not get covered, but they are trying to cover everyone uh, and as, everyone, uh, as we go right now. So uh, the problem of healthcare uh, affordability is also a problem in Indonesia. One thing that's really striking on why we started Prixa is the number of um, healthcare practitioners in Indonesia. WHO kind of suggests that uh, one physician, uh, uh, the, the ratio of physician to patient is one uh, in every thousand people. And in Indonesia, is, uh, it's one in every 4,000 uh, 4, people. So it's like uh, still a huge problem in Indonesia. And doctor is something that uh, we are uh, not uh, able to produce really fast, meaning that the education system, it's going to take a while and the needs to uh, accessible healthcare right now is really uh, crucial. So uh, that's why we're trying to come up with what are the things that we can do with technology that will help this. So in Prixa, a lot of people, when they say AI, uh, there's this misconception that AI will uh, remove uh, the role of people or human. But we in Prixa aim to give patients access to comprehensive healthcare with context that's suitable for them. And also we want to empower and not replacing health practitioners, be it the doctor, nurses, because what we see is that this technology, uh, as Karen also already shared, is that it will help them to work more efficiently, to give um, more uh, context to the healthcare practitioners and a lot more actionable insights that will help them to do more. So we want to give the doctors, the nurses, and all healthcare practitioners in Indonesia more uh, powerful tools to do more things at the same given amount of time. So uh, this is our mission in Prixa, and this is how we carry uh, technology in our products. So uh, Prixa is a uh, First, uh, it's the first AI-based company that combines uh, different diagnosis, different shell diagnosis technology uh, with a platform. And also uh, we wanna be the first personalized health insurance in Indonesia. Uh, um, as we know that uh, AI comes in a lot of uh, different forms. And in Indonesia itself, there's uh, so little um, resources that has Indonesian context to it. So what Brixa is building, we are building uh, a product where we use uh, the natural language technology in Bahasa Indonesia. There's a lot of resources in English and probably other uh, languages, but in Indonesia, there's very little that uses Bahasa Indonesia. So that's why we want to build everything in Bahasa Indonesia. It's more contextual and it's more relatable for the user because the uh, level of uh, literacy in Indonesia is also uh, still something that we're still working on. That's why using uh, our local languages uh, is helping us to get closer to what we wanna achieve in terms of educating the patient itself. So it's a little bit different with what uh, automated response or bot is usually using. So we're using the natural language technology to build a system that will recognize uh, what the patient is trying to say. And we are uh, not just uh, a machine where you can input your uh, symptoms and then uh, there's going to be like a prediction of what you have, but we provide contextual uh, steps that ask you who you are, meaning like uh, your age, your gender assigned at birth, health habits, and also preconditions that you might have. So that it's not gonna be just like when you're going to the search engine and then you type uh, three weeks of headaches, there's a lot of uh, terrifying things that might come up, but we will have enough context to ask the right questions to you. So then we are using the NLP to understand what's the chief complaint of this patient. It's really um, something that we're trying to do because when patient or someone is trying to look for information, uh, sometimes they only have limited understanding of what can help them to get the uh, contextual results that they just uh, probably just type in uh, their uh, symptoms. Uh, but what we wanna get is not only the symptoms, but also the uh, onset of happening. Uh, is it 
uh, getting, uh, is it getting progressing to be worse or not? Is it uh, getting better? Is it triggered by something else? So we have sets of algorithm that will define what's the next question based on your previous answers. And then all, all, of, all of those answers, we will try to predict what are the different cell diagnoses that's possible for you and also do triaging, meaning that uh, are you uh, able to uh, treat this on your own uh, at your home or do you need to talk to a doctor? We also have teleconsultation where we have our doctors uh, stand by to answer follow-up questions or give you more detailed information on what you should do about your symptoms and other condition that you might have. Uh, or probably this is an emergency situation when you need to go to ER or a healthcare facility as soon as possible. So this is what our system is doing. We are trying to empower patients on what are the things that they uh, should know about their condition and what are the things that they could do. And also giving the doctors more information in a structured way. Uh, what are the symptoms that this patient is having? what are the things that's present, what is absent, and other information that might help them to get the resolutions much faster compared to when they have to do it on, your, on their own. And also our system uh, is structured to have uh, steps uh, that oftentimes uh, we are not aware of, like uh, maybe some of these questions needs to be asked and it gets skipped, but our system have a structured way to make all of those check boxes uh, answered before uh, the doctor have this uh, kind of preliminary results of what are the possibilities of the different cell diagnosis. Um, our system is called NALAR. Right now we have uh, extensive coverage. So we have almost a thousand diseases and uh, we are still trying to grow it. We are aiming to uh, cover more than 80% of the primary care conditions that right now is being uh, covered by the national healthcare uh, coverage. So we're trying to make uh, as much uh, as many diseases as possible covered by our system so that people can know what are the next steps for them. Uh, and also the uh, time to get a result is uh, much faster compared to when they just use the uh, usual teleconsultation services. We have uh, or less than three minutes uh, recorded to get uh, the preliminary results of what the condition that this patient might have. And uh, the AI is also being used by the doctors to evaluate, uh, have different cell diagnosis and also uh, make a treatment plans uh, remotely. And this has been a really helpful tool, especially in this pandemic, as what Karen mentioned that right now visiting a hospital is not an easy task. There's a lot of protocols that you need to follow. There's availability uh, issue and there's a lot of things that you need to control. And this system's kind of helping the remote uh, teleconsultation uh, to perform so much better with a lot of more uh, actionable uh, information in there. Uh, so we ask uh, this thing in a way that it's like a fill-in form, but uh, it is not a static form. It will change uh, as you answer the questions. And we are giving them the probability, uh, the probable uh, conditions on uh, the diseases. It's also having all of those information about what are these conditions, or what are the medications that they can take to alleviate the discomfort, what are the things that they need to uh, take notes on, like uh, where should they go to the doctor uh, after doing all of those uh, things that they do in a home care, and uh, even what are some of the lab tests that they need to take or inform the doctor. Uh, suppose they have uh, concerns about their condition. So all of this information is there, and the triaging kind of help the patient to know whether uh, they should stay home or should they call their telemedicine doctors or should they go straight to the ER, that things like that we're trying to do to uh, make the patient have more uh, information and also 
a very contextual to them that's not very general. Uh, because in times like this, it's really easy for us to get overwhelmed with information and take actions that, uh, you know, can lead us to spend more time for something that we don't really need and expose us to uh, more uh, risks. So this type of thing that we're trying to do to contain uh, the risks. Uh, right now, uh, from our telemedicine services, uh, around 70% of people who does telemedicine with us uh, opt up to uh, home care after uh, the consultation. So this has shown to be, you know, uh, a reliable tool for the patients to uh, stay at home uh, based on the instructions that we give. Uh, this is kind of like the gatekeepers of uh, offline healthcare that those, uh, those patients that don't really need to see a doctor uh, they can stay at home with the doctors in the offline settings. They can treat patients that really need them. And our service is not only just uh, using AI uh, to give to give you probable answers, but we also connect it with telemedicine services, uh, offline scheduling with hospitals or clinics. Uh, we also have uh, pharmacy delivery in the pipeline and other services that will give us uh, more power to get patient what they need uh, without leaving the comfort of their home. Uh, this is the one of the uh, study case that we did with uh, this COVID situation. So at the start of this uh, COVID and Q1 this year, we got asked how might we prioritize COVID-19 screening tests in Indonesia. Back in the day, uh, at the very first uh, time when this pandemic hits, there's issues about uh, test uh, availability. And in Indonesia, uh, we kind of reacted to the uh, pandemic rather late compared to probably other countries in Southeast Asia. So when it happens, there's a problem in who should we test if we have a limited amount of resources to test people. So we were working with uh, Jopar Digital Service. It's, uh, it's like a digital services that works for the uh, West Java province in Indonesia. West Java province is the largest uh, and most populous province in Indonesia with more than 50 million people. So we want to help them on how to use our technology to help them prioritize who should get tested first and also to give people access to information because at that time there were a lot of uh, inquiries coming in all the phone uh, all the phone lines were busy uh, doctors were swarmed with a lot of patients with similar conditions so we are we were trying to create uh, a solutions for uh, them with our system that's later adopted by a lot more provinces in Indonesia. And uh, we, we, uh, we are using our technology to not only uh, ask them uh, what their symptom is, but also get uh, information about uh, their travel history, where they are, their contact history, and then uh, kind of give them this, uh, give internally, we have a score to, uh, prioritize who should get the test first and then uh, funnel them to the test. And also for people who have high likability of that, we have a list where the government has, you know, they can do a follow up for people who is not high on the list to get tested right now, but they have high probability of getting COVID. So we are also helping them to prof not profile as in like a who they are, but uh, where can they get them when we have the uh, bandwidth or when we have the task ready uh, to get all of these people. So uh, this were the thing that we were doing to help alleviate the bottleneck uh, in this situation at the time. And we are still doing it with them right now. So within a short amount of time in the first month we launched it, it's uh, almost one people, uh, 1 million people using it and uh, it's rising uh, significantly from our uh, non-COVID screening uh, engine. So this has, has shown that uh, almost half of people who uses their app. Uh, so we, we planted this uh, engine inside their app so that uh, people uh, who needs information about 
COVID, they can also self uh, register and test uh, themselves. And uh, from all of people who's using it, uh, almost 10% of it uh, have screened for COVID-19 rapid, uh, they get a uh, prior test for the test uh, because they're using our system. So uh, we aim to have this three pillars. First is the impactful protocols. Uh, because COVID, there, it's a new thing, then there's a lot of information out there. We want to provide a uh, source of information that people can trust, uh, actions that they can follow. And this has been verified by the WHO and other health authorities that they can follow. So we want to empower the government using this. Uh, and scalable access was something that's uh, really at the forefront of our services. At that time, no, uh, no services can handle uh, that many inquiries of information uh, at a time. And we want to uh, provide the solutions for them. So uh, when all phones goes down, uh, when uh, all of the services is packed, people can still get contextual information for them and have uh, the next steps that they can do readily uh, for them to uh, guide them to, even if you have to isolate them yourself, if you have to call someone, if you have to uh, get some first aid medication to alleviate your symptoms, what you should do, this was something that we were able to do. And also centralized and reliable sources. We help them to have one channel of information to decrease panic and promote self-quarantine at the time, as well as also managing the symptoms because all of all people who uses the, you know, usually the COVID symptoms checker, they don't get results on what should they do based on their symptoms. Usually it's only say you have low chance, you have medium chance, you have high chance of catching COVID based on the symptoms, but there's no next steps for them. Should you take a paracetamol or should you quarantine yourself or anything, but breaks a, helps them to get that next step ready for them. Uh, and this is uh, just uh, our social media handle. You can find us here. Uh, and lastly, uh, I just uh, want to say that really this COVID situation has opened so many opportunities for the healthcare industry to work closer with technology to deliver better outcomes. And uh, we are excited to see what other collaboration with technology that we can do in healthcare to solve more problems. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much uh, for sharing, Rosie. Um, so I think at this point, I'm gonna transition into a bit of a Q and A and uh, more than Q and A, I think more of a discussion between our uh, panelists, both of whom have actually touched on uh, some interesting themes. Um, so I can see some of the questions that have been asked. Um, so I'm going to use those to sort of probe a bit deeper. So one of our attendees asked actually whether uh, they, just like the COVID apps, could something be created for mental disorder detection? So of course, Karen then shared about her project uh, with Care Space and so on. So just to follow up on that, I think this question I want to ask actually really both panelists um, in your experience. Um, so what type of mental health disorders have, um, have we seen the sort of successes with in terms of these technologies? You know, what sort of disorders are our current technologies able to detect and which perhaps not yet? Because I think that's a theme, uh, mental health especially, uh, it's a theme that's important and increasingly more important to, to all of us, perhaps because of the lockdown and everything. Uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Karen would like to um, share her thoughts first. Yeah, sure. So um, actually, um, interestingly, you know, mental health is a very taboo topic, especially for Asians. I mean, yeah, in, in America and in Europe, probably people are more open to speak with. But in Asia, it's almost a shush shush topic. I mean, nobody ever speaks about it. But with COVID, um, those have kind of become very prominent because it's not just the elderly but it's the younger and even the school going people who've been actually affected mentally. So I'll answer your question in two ways. One is the most common mental health, which is underestimated is depression. Uh, and what we have is uh, interestingly, we are actually right now in discussions in Singapore where 
what we're doing is how do you um, it's not so much as uh, detecting depression but how do you manage it because everybody gets depressed once in a while but how do i kind of manage it and those who are chronically depressive how do we alter medication based on the symptoms because you see gone are the days where you go to a doctor um he says one tablet twice daily for the next 3 months it doesn't work like that because some days you're very depressed some day you're not so depressed but the medication remains the same so we have things like the iot which is internet of things uh we have simple apps and that again through bots which will ask you questions so how are you feeling today you know just press happy sad and so there are different parameters that using ai you can actually track and then based on that when the doctor looks at the data he say hey you've had a bad patch um so do i need to kind of increase the medication because you seem to be you know in a very low mood for example or you seem to be more depressed uh, and so as and as you know one of the major many of the markets in this part of the world have high suicide rate and that's simply because medication is not given at the right time and the, all those symptoms are ignored right so that's one side and i think depression is quite serious the other one that um like dementia alzheimer right in singapore you have a singapore startup called connected life and those of you are interested to reach out where things like you know dementia um, you can actually detect that very early even before even the individual realizes that he or she has some problem the way you walk the way you talk and nowadays almost everybody has a smart watch or a smart device so you can begin to collect data with like you know your sleep data your walk your steps and lots of now parameters have come in blood pressure um, i don't know what else they monitor um so based on those uh, parameters you, you can use ai models ai algorithms and those of you interested please reach out to daryl from connected life uh, who has an awesome uh, app on this so that's basically and parkinsons parkinsons is massive it's like you really have no cure so some of these diseases which have no cure especially even on the mental side how do we kind of regress the progression we cannot cure it but can we make the quality of life better can we slow down that progression so people are able to enjoy life better these are some of the very interesting cool apps that we already have using data and ai and you guys and if you're interested please reach out to them thank you so much uh, for sharing rosie perhaps your thoughts on this Yeah, uh, I agree with Karen that mental health is uh, an, a rising topic, especially in Indonesia. Also, right now, uh, with the growing um, right right now, like uh, awareness of the mental health itself. In Priksa, we do have several mental health conditions that's baked into Priksa because a lot of people they might not know that it's a sign of uh, like mental health disorder. For example, their chief complaint might be uh, I'm unable to sleep or like. uh they have certain uh condition that is related to mental health but they didn't really see it right now we do have some uh mental health uh conditions that's baked into our engine and uh we're trying to also expand on what are the things that can do that uh, we can do with ai because uh mental health is a little bit different with uh, a lot of other diseases that uh for example the tools that's usually being used is uh like uh questionnaire uh, and other tools that used to diagnose mental health is different with uh, other diseases so we are also thinking on like in the future what are the things that we can do with technology to make that more scalable and there's a lot of uh, i think uh, use cases of ai that we can adopt to expand the coverage of what we can do and one of the things that we also uh, trying to do in Priksa is that uh, understanding that if there's like a uh, suicidal attempts or uh you know um behaviors that might be harmful for the patient we have this uh, emergency flow where if patients does this uh the first thing that we should do is either connect them to a doctor that they can talk to or uh advise them to contact 911 uh, immediately because it's a serious condition and not a lot of people are trained to be a first responder and that's what we're trying to do in Precise to help them realize that this is an emergency situation and you need to get the proper care for that condition yeah brilliant uh thank you for sharing um okay so now i'll move on to another uh at least related to another question that another one of our attendees asked the patient uh, sorry the attendee asked uh, what happens if patients become inactive and do not reply to the chat bot so just to expand on that theme more 
I think my question to uh, both the speakers really is, um, you know, just as there's adherence to medication, there would be adherence to digital therapies. So in terms of the products that um, you are working on or have worked on, um, how are some of the ways that you measure, um, you know, patient engagement and the so-called stickiness of the app? Uh, because after all, um, in a real world setting outside of a trial or a pilot, if uh, patients drop off from using the apps for with what, whatever reason, then necessarily it's not going to be effective. Uh, perhaps Dr. Karen first. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much. So, um, I mean, it's uh, it's a well-known number that the average um, span that one spends on an app is about two and a half months. Uh, that's what uh, most of the apps have a life of. Uh, and if it's a games, it's even shorter. Um, I'm sure those of you who have kids or siblings at home, you will see that the number of apps kids change is like, you know, it's just like their clothes. So yes, but when it comes to healthcare apps, um, I think two and a half months is what people say normally one sticks on an app. But here's the thing. You see, when you look at things like WhatsApp, when you look at things like Facebook, I don't think people drop off so fast, right? And why is that? Because the content is different every day. Um, the engagement model is very different. Uh, and many times you get a gratif gratification, you can see people posting and that inspires you or, you know, kind of, there are a lot of emotions. So that exactly is what we are looking for in terms of having an app. An app that is static uh, is, is gonna be of no use. So you need to have an app, especially for adherence. Uh, and that's why AI is important. It's not just a yes, no kind of an answer, right? It has to adapt to the data that it is reading off from the patient. So one of the very interesting examples is, I'm not sure how many of you are from Singapore, but one of the examples is the 10,000 footsteps, right? Uh, which the government launched. Um, we had, they had a successful first year, then they went on to the second year. And why was that? Because the nudges were very personalized. So every person would not get the nudge, same nudge at the same time, no. So depending on how your walking pattern has been across the whole week, you would be nudged according to that. Which are the moments where you're low which are the moment that you kind of slow down and that's when the nudge happens. And what is it that would motivate you? What is it that would um, kind of, uh, you know, encourage you? Uh, are you a challenger or are you a, a kind of a more stoic kind? So these are the things which you need to really, and I think most of the apps now do that. Uh, you kind of align the way you interact with the patient based on um, those kind of data that's being collected. And that is why in previously I was saying that, Bot is just not a conversation. It's about also collecting that information and, and customizing that interaction based on whom they are interacting with. So I think that is why um, when it comes to healthcare apps, like we have the health buddy, for example, in Singapore, normally it's longer because there are multiple things on that, but uh, unless and otherwise you make it fun, engaging with some reward. I mean, all of us love rewards, even if it's a small reward. Uh, so if you can incorporate that, and most of the insurance companies do a good job. So you have all the loyalty apps that they have. They kind of keep you engaged with them, right? They give you, if you do 5,000 steps, and if you do 10,000 steps, then you get $5 off. I mean, the $5 you really don't need, you know, but the whole fact that you want it and you can boast about it to your other people. I mean, that's the whole fun part. So I think that is super important in healthcare. We have it in other markets as well as in the insurance side. But I think in, in healthcare, we need a little bit more fun as well. Thank you. I think uh, very well said, especially the line that I'll remember is if the app is static, then it's useless. <laughs> with that, uh, perhaps Rosie, you could share a bit more. Yeah, yeah I think uh, I would agree with Karen that a lot of it has to do with personalized recommendation based on interest. I think uh, what all of these social media and other apps uh, has been very successful to do is engaging people with the thing that they're interested in. So it has uh, the, the you know those elements where, oh, it actually knows me personally. And it, there's a lot of uh, incentives that's uh, being baked into a lot of services right now. And the social aspect with like uh, sharing, uh, asking more people to do a challenge together, things like that can help a lot in you know prolonging uh, engagement in terms of what uh, people do and uh, how we kind of grow them inside of our ecosystem. Because especially with healthcare and a lot of uh, things that's related to diseases, uh, the 
good outcome uh, is always coming from a prolonged use and you know uh, adherence, things like that. So it's very important for us to bake into like the fun part because when people usually when they heard the word healthcare when they uh, see uh, drugs hospitals it's nothing fun in their head but it's time to you know mix up some of the things that can be a fun incentive for them to uh, interact with the platform itself thank you very much um okay so now i'm going to move on to another question um that came in from our uh, uh, and these. Um, so the question really, I think this one I would direct it to Dr. Karen uh, in particular, because the question uh, that she shared was, what are the challenges that you face in uh, chatbot deployment? But to that, I want to add a spin. Uh, would be, uh, really, how does Microsoft, for example, which is a well-known tech company, uh, but not particularly well-known as a healthcare company, how does it, uh, how does it uh, co-create uh, with clinical users for example, you've worked with the NHS and you've worked with um, other big hospitals or healthcare groups. So what is the role, what is the process in which this co-creation with uh, clinical uh, clinical uh, users or people actually done? Um, what is the timeline? Yeah. Uh, so thanks, Oma. That's, uh, I think the latter part of your question is very interesting. So one of the problems that we have with bots, as you know, it's also an evolution, right? I mean, I think a few years ago, one would have heard of a bot, or probably when you hear a bot, you would say, ah, that's a machine, I know for sure. So one of the challenges that we do have with bots is adoption. And I think, I think you shared it earlier as well, is that I can't have the same bot for every profile of the population. And that is why people are now moving on, you know, based on feedback. Technology is all about a feedback loop. So you would give a feedback. And so as I was sharing my presentation, you have voice enabled um, chatbots. We have this uh, very cute chatbot that's like a companion for the elderly, right? So it would say, hello, um, it's time for your medication. And it's like voice based. Uh, and the thing is that, you know, old people, they have this habit. They'll ask the same question again and again every day. So this bot would kind of reply. And in a very nice voice, a very humane voice. So the bot is now being trained to to have a very humane voice. So for the elderly who are probably forgetful, for them it's very comforting. So I would say building bots, which building technology per se is not very complex, but incorporating it with AI, with NLP, with QNA models, I think that's the interesting part. And I think that's where I wouldn't say it's a bottleneck, but it's more like how do you infuse the technology that surrounds us into that? So how do I get um, IoT into that? Um, how do I kind of marry two different technologies into that? So I think that's the beautiful part. And I think the most interesting population, this is my personal opinion, are the elderly and the children. I think if you're able to get it right for the elderly and the children, you've nailed it because these are two very demanding populations and they have very short attention span. They want change. The elderly want something that's repetitive, probably and easy to use. So I think they are the most difficult groups to please. Uh, and that's where I see, you know, bots really evolving. So I wouldn't say there is a there is any bottleneck per se, but it's just that based on the use case and based on the user, we are adapting and adopting as well. So I think it's work in progress. Now coming back to your second question, which I think is super interesting, most of the examples that you I shared are partner solutions. So Microsoft per se, unlike our competitors, we don't create products. We develop products in a prototype fashion, and then we look for partners like. Rossi, for example. So like we have teams and we have a telemed solution, but we don't go to the market and say, hey, this is Microsoft telemed solution. You'll never see that. So our route is always through partners. So we would look, come to Rossi and say, hey, you know, you're in Indonesia and you have local language capabilities. So is there a way that we can partner with you, use our teams and you can build on it. And just recently, I think on the 28th of October, we launched the GA for the Microsoft Cloud for Healthcare. I'm not sure how many of you heard about it, but that's exactly the same thing. How do you create a platform with some of the core Microsoft products, but you give the partners building blocks. So you give them accelerators, you give them pre-built dashboards, APIs, you give it to them so that you know people can build. Uh, healthcare is so complex that no one company can really boast and say, I have all the solutions in the world, right? So this is where the Microsoft platform is an open platform where you know partners can come in and I think to the count I forget but we have 68,000 partners who build with us 
Uh, so this is where Microsoft really kind of, you know, brings together. So we prototype it and then we look for partners who can commercialize it. So that's the model that we run with. And of course it's built on Microsoft Azure using Microsoft tools, but we look for partners who can run with us and we kind of enable them to commercialize it. Those of you who have uh, heard of Nuance, uh, recently we signed uh, Nuance. I think it's there in almost all hospitals where it's basically voice to text. Uh, for doctors who can just speak and then, you know, it kind of translates it, uh, uh, record transcripts it into text. So how do you infuse that with AI? And this is where Microsoft will come in and say, hey, can I bring this technology in and merge it with what you have and come out with something that is a new product that can help the doctors much better? That's exactly the model. And I think I've rarely seen, uh, been in healthcare space for quite some time. I've rarely seen anybody do it so well where, you know, everybody's like, you're welcome and please build with us. I think that is a very, how to say, rich environment, creative. Thank you so, so Rossi, much. you get the message. <laughs> I think that was very, very insightful. I think uh, if one thing I can draw from that, it's really that it's a collaboration between uh, healthcare providers, clinical uh, yeah. experts, and the technology that helps to enable it. Um, okay, so I think uh, we probably don't have much more time. So maybe I'll just have one question that I'm going to um, uh, address to Rossi in particular. So we did look at, you know, quite a few, um, you know, both from Microsoft and uh, of course uh, from Prixa uh, in terms of like um, triaging or symptom uh, detection or even um, disease prediction, uh, diagnosis, uh, differential diagnoses and such. So Rosie, could you perhaps just share with us um, kind of some of the, the legal challenges or responsibilities uh, that, that uh, permeate this issue? Because, you know, in, uh, for example, if they're talking about missed diagnoses or wrong diagnoses or potentially inappropriate um, uh, recommendations and interventions, um, how do you, in your experience, how have you perhaps dealt with some of these and what are some of the strategies that we can take uh, moving forward? Yeah, uh, I think one of the hardest thing in doing everything with technology remotely right now, especially with healthcare that requires us to kind of give recommendation on the next step uh, that can be like a treatment or a medicine is that we have very limited uh, tools to do uh, like uh, follow up screenings or additional, uh, you know, physical checkup. So, so that's why I think uh, we are shying away from uh, using the word of diagnosis because it kind of requires you to do physical checkup, you do a follow-up like labs and other things. So it's always a challenge for us to, uh, you know, uh, even say uh, what the conditions that you are having. That's why in Prixa, we always come up with uh, differential diagnosis and we kind of give them the red alert, right? So uh, for example, if uh, we kind of think that you have this, even after a teleconsultation, there's still like room for errors, right? Uh, the, the doctor is just talking to you, but they're not checking your heartbeat. Uh, they don't know your, uh, you know, uh, your uh, CT scan and things like that. So we kind of told them that uh, these are the red flags and signs that you need to be aware of. We will be checking on you from time to time. If this happens, please do uh, contact uh, medical practitioners directly or go to a facility. So the, those are the things that, you know, we were trying to be, uh, uh, you know, creating solutions, but also we want to put patient safety first. It has been always on the, uh, back of our head that uh, we, yes, we do want to shorten your uh, medical visits, but at the same time, we don't want to get you in trouble for something that we don't know. So most of uh, the practices that we're doing right now uh, is still, uh, we are dealing with uh, primary care uh, related symptoms, or if it's a follow up for, um, uh, you know, like a chronic diseases visit, it is something that uh, we, that take more care of that we call the doctors, we do all of this uh, uh, medical information thing so that nothing is missing. Uh, and this kind of thing, I know that a lot of healthcare uh, startup is uh, doing their own thing in the way that they deliver their solutions. But in Pritza, we are trying to uh, also work very closely with a physical healthcare facility that we can refer to every time we see a potential problem uh, or to prevent things from going bad. So uh, having that uh, 
like physical uh, healthcare facility is uh, one of the key things that we also want to promote because uh, most of the things uh, uh, that we don't see uh, right now is because of this uh, technology is not here yet. Uh, if there's an IoT for us to track everything real time and we can get it, that's going to be really nice. But uh, with this shortcomings, I think uh, those are the things that we're trying to do to prevent um, like misdiagnosis or uh, you know mistreatment of the patients. Thank you so much. Um, I think that was very eloquent to put and also I think you've been very candid sharing as well. So I think with that, um, we probably have almost run out of time. So I think I just want to thank um, both speakers again, Dr. Karen, Dr. Rossi, and of course, uh, AITI uh, and Recap for giving us the opportunity to discuss. Um, with that, uh, perhaps I'll hand over back to um, the MC. Uh, so yeah, thanks everyone. Thank you, Karen, Rosti, and Istimam for the material, as well as the interesting discussion regarding AI chatbot and the resulted experience in healthcare aspect. Hopefully, it can be beneficial for everyone. Unfortunately, we have limited time, and the time is up for today. But if you have questions that have not been answered and you want to connect with Karen, Rosti, and Istimam, you can connect with them through LinkedIn. Now I would like to invite Karen and Rossi to deliver closing messages for our attendees in here. Uh, please, Karen and Rossi. Yeah, I think uh, I'll go first. Uh, I think what uh, we've learned from today and what from what Karen has shared is very true. I think. Collaboration is key into making progresses and impacts, especially in healthcare. There's a lot of hard work, but uh, I know that there's also a lot of opportunity uh, that we can do to make progresses in healthcare. And um, I know that healthcare is maybe lagging a little bit behind from other industries, but we have a lot of uh, you know great talents and great technology helping us right now. And uh, collaboration is really key. Thank you. Yeah, so probably at my end, um, I mean, thanks so much for this opportunity. It was really nice. Uh, love to learn about the telemed solution that we have in uh, Indonesia. So thank you so much, Rossi, for that. Um, but I, I would fully agree with what he said is that in healthcare, I think it's all about collaboration. Um, and I think no, no problem is unsolvable. I think it's the way we approach it and the kind of technology we bring to the fore. And so um, I'm really glad if there are startups or people who are listening on the call who have some very interesting, innovative solutions, please do reach out to me. Um, happy to kind of work with you and you know, kind of see how we can help from the technology side. So thank you so much. Thank you, Karen and Rossi for the messages. And before we close the session, I'd like to invite Mohamed Zohilmi Bin Zaini from AITI to deliver a closing remark. Thank you, Elika. Thank you to our speakers, Dr. Karen and Mr. Rossi for the informative and insightful session today. And also thanks to our moderator, Iti Itimam. Again, thank you to all for taking your time out of the session today. Your participation is very much appreciated. I hope everyone was able to have some fruitful takeaways that would be applicable for your business organization. For your information, AITA will be organizing another webinar on topics related to artificial intelligence as well as Internet of Things uh, sometime this month. You are all welcome to participate and please look out for our next advert or invitation. Now I shall pass the floor back to our MC, Elika. Thank you, Zul, and thank you so much for AITI to initiate this webinar. For everyone who wants to know more about our next webinar, you can find it on our social media that is already written in the chat box. We will be more than excited if you want to join our next webinar. And for the details, we will update it on our social media. So stay tuned. Also, it will mean so much for this webinar if you can fill out the polling so we can improve the quality of our next webinar.
I think we arrive at the end of our session. Thank you again for everyone that has joined and stay until the end of the session. And I would like to thank again our speaker Karen and Rossi as well as our moderator Imam. Hopefully we can meet again in the future. Thank you very much everyone. I hope we will see you again in our next webinar.